Hello, science enthusiasts. Welcome to Science Chat. It's part of our Spaces Unleashed platform on Twitter. Every week, we bring you an amazing expert to enthrall you with your their area of knowledge. Today, we're talking nuclear. Or is it nuclear? <laughs> with nuclear engineer Maraid Montagu. Um, Maraid, rhymes with parade. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited to have you back. Um, there was three of you that we chatted with about nuclear energy over the span of about a year last year. Um, and I believe you were the first we talked about nuclear stuff. I was. I was the first one. Um, and then Amanda, I think, was next. And yeah, Amanda I see, I see Amanda. There, Amanda's here. Yes. If you uh, hold your finger on their profile, you can send them a private emoji. So I've just mm-hmm. privately waved to Amanda. Wait, this is not so private if I say it. Oh, she waved back. She waved back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Maraid, l- let's get right to it. Uh, I introduce you as a nuclear engineer. And the first thing we kind of get right down to brass tacks about is what, uh, what's going on with your education? What, what does it take to be a nuclear engineer or somebody in nuclear science? Yeah, so I got my bachelor's in nuclear engineering um, and finished in spring of 2018. So I went to UC Berkeley and I did that. After that, I moved to Tennessee. Um, So now I am, I just finished up my fourth year of grad school at the University of Tennessee. I got my master's in December of 2019 and I've been doing PhD work ever since. Wow, good Um, for you. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, I do, my research is subcontracted out to Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, So all of, I don't even go to the UT campus anymore. I just go straight to Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, And so that's where almost everything that I do is now. I'm almost never on campus. Mm, Okay. So how, this is the, this is the tough question. Um, you're working on your PhD. How long does, do you, do you anticipate that taking? Cause that's, that's kind of a nebulous question, right? It is. Um, so <laughs> I'm not trying to put pressure on you. I'm just curious. No, I do have actually a good answer for this. So I just finished up my fourth year. Um, and that's starting from a bachelor's. Mm. So I worst case scenario will be done in spring 2023. So oh a year goodness. from now, worst case scenario, I'll be done. You're almost um, done. I am. And at the moment, I'm kind of going through some general bureaucratic red tape mm. when it comes to dealing with Oak Ridge, which is, you know, that's what happens when you're working with any government entity. You know, it takes a little bit longer to get things done. Um, if I could get things to speed up, I would be able to finish by December, but it's kind of looking like I'm not going to be able to defend until maybe early February. Um, so, and then technically I won't graduate until May, even Mm. if I'm done with everything in February. Gotcha. So, well, we will be cheering you on when that happens. One of the most exciting things for me running the science podcast and now these spaces is, um, having interviewed some younger scientists as they've been finishing up their PhD to then having them back and calling them a doctor. Um, that's very, very cool. Um, so we are wishing you the best of luck with that as you continue towards that amazing goal. Um, Marit, I got a, I got a follow up question. It is no joke getting into what you've gotten into in science. Um, what, what, why were you so interested in science? W- were you interested when you were young? Was there something that changed in your, your childhood? I have always been interested in science. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was a little bit odd in my family. Both of my parents are double English and history majors. Um, Nobody, I mean, except for one of my mom's brothers who was an engineer, nobody really else into science. Um, But I can remember being in fourth grade and making a, um, of, we were trying to pretend that we were making generators to make power in our desks. Okay. And it was like, it was like a spring from a lead pencil 
um, and like a junior mints box. And we were like, <laughs> oh, if we keep cranking the spring, it'll move around and it'll it'll start making energy. And we we're just, <laughs> I don't know, it was something ridiculous. But that was when I was first thinking about, that's the first time I can remember thinking about doing some sort of uh, science. So I kind of always knew I was going to go into science. I just wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do. Um, and that took a little bit to figure out, like, what what was I interested in? What do I like? Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually realized when I was taking chemistry in high school that the only part of chemistry I really, really, really found interesting was the part on nuclear stuff. Oh, so not all the other parts of chemistry? No, I don't. (laughs) Um, And that being said, I took two years of chemistry. I took regular honors chem, and then I took AP. Oh, you took AP, yep. (laughs) I did. Um, And so that being said, my favorite part was still the nuclear part. So I said, well, I like this. Why don't I figure out what somebody can do with this? Okay. Um, so I learned about nuclear power and I thought, well, that's really exciting. And it's going to save the world. It could, uh, it, there are a lot of people that are saying it, it may, may very well save the world. And it still very well may. Um, but then I went to college and realized, you know what, maybe this part of saving the world is not exactly for me. Um, so I pivoted a little bit from power generation into nuclear security, um, and I do security for nuclear fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the reasons why I like to come talk about nuclear power is because as somebody who does not look at nuclear power every single day, super in depth, I still remember how to talk about it. So that's, that's where everybody, yeah, Marie, that's where I was hoping we'd be able to go because, um, unless you, I guess like, unless you live around a nuclear plant or somebody has taught you about it, they're almost like magic and you either know Homer Simpson or you've seen Chernobyl and that is all you know about nuclear power. Both are kind of have a negative, (laughs) negative image. So um, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about what nuclear power is, just kind of in broad strokes. So nuclear power includes taking uranium atoms um, and adding enough energy to them that they start dividing. If you add enough energy to them and they divide, they give off a lot more energy and a majority of it in the form of heat. So kind of like most types of power that we have, nuclear energy is just a giant heating thing to make steam. It's just a giant steam generator. Um, The same thing with coal or natural gas. We just make things hot. We make steam. It turns a turbine. It's just that we do it a little bit differently instead of by burning a fossil fuel Um, we decide we're going to add some amount of energy to naturally occurring isotopes. And once they start dividing, the amount of energy and heat that they give off is enough to actually boil water. Hmm. Now, would would this stuff break down by itself just a lot slower? We're just speeding up the... Okay. It would break down, but it would be on the scale of about a billion years. Mm, That's a little too slow for me. You know, I'm a patient Ooh. guy, but uh, a billion years, that's a lit, you know, your food's going to get cold. Yeah. Um, and so that is something that radiation is very interesting because a lot of times people hear radiation and they think, oh my, it's the worst thing there is. Well, it's kind of like it happens all around us all the time. Um it's just that we're controlling it and we're using it for our own purposes mm. instead of letting it have a decay once every billion years, we're controlling what we're doing and we're making more decays, um, more reactions and we're creating energy and power. Mm. So this, the way <laughs> I've explained this to my students before, because I, I teach uh, one aspect of science about different methods of uh, power and with the exception of solar energy, 
we really just have to find ways to spin a thing. Like, yep. so you burn coal, it heats up water, the water pressurizes and spins a thing. And the same thing happens with natural gas. The same thing happens with um, wind. You don't have to burn anything. It just spins the thing. And that's what happens with nuclear, right? You, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, the, the uranium goes kapow, and then it gives off its energy. It doesn't go explode, but it just like uh, decays and gives off that energy, which heats up the water, which spins the thing. Yeah, basically. Um, what we have, when we start a nuclear power plant, we have um, enriched uranium-235, with a specific um, part of uranium, the specific isotope, and we, it, sorry, in the United States, we enrich it. In Canada, you do not. Yeah, we're different, um, eh? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, but it makes for some really big puns. Your reactors are called can-do reactors, and man, you can do it over there. Yeah, um, they are. They're called the can-do reactors. So in the U.S., we have two main reactor types, um, and they both start with enriching uranium-235 up to somewhere between 3 to 5%. Hmm. Um, it is normally about 0.07%, right? So it's, it's an amount of enrichment that takes some time and energy in and of itself. Um, but once we have it at that three to 5%, we can put it in reactors and we can add a starting, uh, neutron source to it. So we have a lot of things that just as they're decaying, they give off neutrons themselves and so we can put them in a reactor, and that'll start everything up. So when the neutrons coming out of that naturally start, um, they will hit these uranium-235 isotopes. And that will get excited. Um, and with the amount of energy that those absorb from the neutrons, um, they will then divide themselves into two or three uh, different isotopes, of, like smaller ones. Um, and then they will let off one or two neutrons of their own. And so the neutrons that they let off go on and they hit another U-235 isotope. And that continues the reaction. Um, so it is self sustaining once you get it started because you will have one to two neutrons come out. Um, it could be two to three. It depends on, you know, what energies and whatnot um, that hit every time. And so that's how we have this sustained chain reaction that we use. But every time it divides, every isotope that divides gives off a certain amount of heat hmm. and a certain amount of energy. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, that is what happens in there. Um, so without the neutron starter, the uranium is just going to sit there. Oh yeah. It'll oh, okay. There. You can pick up uranium. You can pick up unburned spent fuel, spent fuel that we haven't really done anything to. You can hold it in your hand. Um, you can anything. It's very safe. Um, because when it's there, it's that stuff takes a billion years to have a decay. Right. Um, so the fact that, you know, it's, even though we've enriched a little bit, that's still a billion year half-life. It's the, the level of radiation before we start introducing new neutrons is very, very low. It's perfectly fine. Um, and, you know, sometimes you'll see cool photos of people holding. I've seen that. Rods. I was like, what are you doing? Why would you do that? But now it makes sense. It's just not yes. emitting it's all not of that. Dan- yeah, it's not emitting dangerous. What's it? So, um, mm. so is, is uranium-235 this enriched stuff like – just like is having a bad day, but just holding itself together just enough to get through the day. And then these neutron starters come along and it's like somebody just says the wrong thing. And it's like, well, that's it. And it upends the apple cart. Um, it's maybe, you know, maybe it's a little bit more stable than that. Okay. Um, we can say it's somebody who's having a bad day, but they've got like, maybe, maybe, it has to be a bigger event to really be the thing that breaks the camel's back. Okay, so like they're having a bad day. They go to Tim Hortons or Starbucks. There's a giant line. When they get there, their Kappa Frappuccino is all sold out. They go outside. They step in dog poop. Like there's a series of events that make them eventually, you know, have a meltdown. Yeah, because, you know, by themselves, if they were just allowed to go home and go to bed, they'd be fine. <laughs> okay. If you just 
If you he just, just left, left the alone. uranium alone, <laughs> if you just left the uranium alone, it would be fine. But you do like you add so much agitation in the form of energy from neutrons that you have a threshold, and above that threshold, that's when you're getting um, the actual fissions that occur. Is you have to hit like some some energy threshold. And once it gets that, and it captures that, that's when it goes. I love it. Marita, I could talk to you about nuclear energy for hours. I, I just love nu- – it's just so fascinating. Um, if you are just tuning in now, hello, this is Science Chat. And we every week we bring an expert guest to you to enthrall you with their area of knowledge. Today we have nuclear engineer Maraid Montague, and we're talking all things nuclear. Um, after some more questions that I have, we'll open up the floor to the audience to ask questions. Um, I do have a follow-up question. So what is the advantage of, say, nuclear power – versus burning coal right like there's obviously some disadvantages to nuclear power which we'll get into in my follow-up questions of the follow-up question but why would you use nuclear power instead of coal like what's why so nuclear power does not add any carbon dioxide into our atmosphere um it's co2 free so it is a green energy um and we'll, we'll talk about waste in a few minutes and we'll talk about what we do with nuclear waste. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't add any more carbon dioxide. It's not a fossil fuel. Um, burning it doesn't end up with any more pollutants. Um, you end up with, you end up with things like hydrogen sometimes, um, and, but you don't necessarily end up with things that really actually are, are continuing to cause problems for climate change and global mm. warming, um, which is great. And that's a fantastic thing. That's one of the main staples of nuclear energy is that we don't make things worse in this way. This is this is one of the things, one of the problems that it really helps solve. Gotcha. Um this is what I was alluding to that um, a lot of people who are looking to power in the future are looking to nuclear um, as the quote unquote bridge thing before before we can maybe get batteries better for green stuff like windmills and solar panels. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people who there's a lot of people who think that nuclear is going to be very good as a uh, bridging the gap. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of people who think that nuclear is going to be part of the solution. It it should always be part of the solution. It should just be there. Um, It should be. We should just use it continuously. Yeah. Yeah, And there's uh, a lot of people. Oh, I lost you. Sorry. I lost you. You I got muted. Um, Oh. (laughs) uh, So there's a lot of people who say that nuclear power is – Um, it it should be the baseline. Um, So we do have a lot of fluctuations with the energy usage that we have during the day, during the evening, everything else. Um, So a lot of arguments for uh, climate-friendly solutions say that, hey, we have a base load of nuclear power, something that's going to be very reliable, Mm. something that's going to reliably produce the amount of energy that we we will need. Um, And then the question is, um, okay, great. If we have a nuclear base load, how do we get when everybody has their air conditioner on? Uh, Not in Canada, but everywhere else. Um, Oh no, it can get hot in Canada for about a week. For that week where you desperately want your air conditioning, (laughs) (laughs) but you, you have a base load of nuclear. If you had a base load of nuclear power, you could do, you know, solar power or wind or something else um, to help support the additional energy needs during that time. Um, so that's sort of the base load argument for nuclear power is make sure that you have enough that everything, you know, that the power is on everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then when you need surges at different times of the day, which 
um, people are actually working on algorithms and things like that to figure out how much of a surge happens at different parts of the day and how you can correct for, you know, holiday or, um, you know, in the UK, they, they correct for uh, everybody starting their tea kettles at <laughs> the halftime of a soccer game. I'll tell you, there's uh, going to be a lot of power being used in about in two hours in Alberta, Canada, because the Battle of Alberta is starting between the Edmonton Oilers and the Calgary Flames for the Stanley Cup. I it's know. A hockey and joke. I, oh, I'm aware. I just want you to know that I had to stop watching the Rangers Carolina game for this. Oh, oh and I'm the so Rangers sorry. Rangers were up 2 <laughs> Um But um, yeah, no, I was I was also excited about the uh, Battle of Alberta. I was wondering if you were going to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, at some point there will be a big surge right there in Alberta of people watching that um, and try to correct for that amount of energy that's going to start um but you need to make sure that you have enough face load that you you can power and you keep the lights on everywhere Mm -hmm. gotcha so marie the the follow-up question to this is that that's uh you know uh, nuclear power doesn't produce co2 awesome um Nuclear power can be used as a base load in the future, which is awesome. But there are also some da- drawbacks to nuclear power. And, and, and that's one of the things that you are working on right now, which is nuclear safety. Um, so it's a two part question, I guess. One, how safe is nuclear power? And then what do folks like you do to keep society safe with the use of nuclear power? Yeah. Oh. So- Nuclear power, we understand that there's a lot of reasons why people are hesitant about nuclear power. Um, And we understand that it can seem very scary. And that being said, a lot of time and a lot of energy goes into regulations for safety for nuclear, including things like, okay, if your plant starts to get, if something goes wrong, um, how can we design reactors such that they shut themselves down? It's called passive safety systems. And a lot of it is if we start designing reactors that if something goes wrong, they will shut themselves down. Then we're doing, you know, that's a big, big plus for safety. Um, so nuclear power is, it is safe. Um, Amanda is here and does a little bit more as far as dealing with the um, some like directly some of the waste. Mm-hmm. Um, I deal with a lot of the how do we make sure no bad guys get waste or get nuclear stuff. Um, but as far as and we're talking you like B level villains in Tom Cruise movies getting their hands on this stuff yes okay yeah um so as far as like the nuclear power plants themselves go um it's probably a really solid time to have me on because who or not who uh netflix just did their new three mile island i know i've been wanting to watch that but i'm like oh do i really want to watch the three mile isle doc three mile documentary so yes um i have not seen it i've seen some of the comments across nuclear twitter um, and generally, it goes along the lines of the Chernobyl stuff. It's like, man, for so well, okay. At least through my island, it's like for so little to have happened in the long term. Um, the documentary is so dramatic, um, and and that's a lot of you know, the media portrayal of nuclear stuff is that the answer is, wow, this is so dramatic and it's not accurate or it's very misleading as to how it portrays things. Um, The Three Mile Island disaster, quote unquote, um, you know, they had determined that there was no excess um, radiation released to the environment. Um, We did have a U.S. president at the time walking through the water that was there. Um, so things happened like the the core did uh, melt down, and there was an explosion due to 
hydrogen buildup, um, but there was not really an external release of radiation. Unfortunately, a lot of nuclear problems come down to, well, the reactor was doing what it was supposed to be doing, and then people decided to interfere. Mm. Um, and it's that's kind of similar to how uh, Three Mile Island goes as well. Um, is there were a lot of people who had to override safety systems manually, and unfortunately, um, it did happen. Fortunately, nobody was particularly hurt. Um, however, a lot of the things that we have now that we've learned since Chernobyl, that we've learned since um, through My Island, has changed the way that we design some of the reactors and has changed some of what we do. In the case of Chernobyl, we stopped using that type of reactor completely. In the case of Three Mile Island, um, you know, we had other safety systems, other redundancies built in. Um, and, and those kind of things, uh, the fact that they learn and they grow from what accidents occur to prevent it from ever happening again. Um, that's one of the, I think, one of the better things about the nuclear industry. Um, so you know, if you're a normal person and you have a reactor in your backyard, oh, sorry, my dog is biting my thumb. Um, if you have a reactor in your backyard, which we kind of have one very close by here in Watts Bar um, in Tennessee, you know, it's you're not getting any exceptionally increased amount of dose. And I would not particularly be worried about having that reactor there and very close to you um, because. With these reactors, um, there are so many safety systems implemented. They're tested regularly. Uh, and the dose that you're getting outside the fence is, is well, there's a level. There's an appropriate level that the government says, hey, this is the level that it's allowed to be outside the fence. Um, so generally, we're very, very, very strict in the nuclear field about following these uh, different rules and regulations, especially for power plants and for spent fuel storage. Um, those two things happen a bit here in Tennessee. Um, and so I've been able to take a couple of classes and talk to some experts in the area um, about, you know, what they do here and what they're keeping an eye out for. Um, and it, it's been really interesting to see and talk to them about both the physical protection, um, the actual like science of it. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a military op in a lot of ways, but it's very cool. Um, it's easy for me to say, don't be worried about it if you have a nuclear power plant in your backyard. Uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm so familiar with what we do. So I really <laughs> hope that like, I really hope somebody has a question when we get to the time for questions, like more specifically right. um, that I can make sure that the guy address because, you know, as I said, it's easy for me to say like, all right, well, I understand like what these regulations are and what they mean. Like dose, we have things that are dose rates and the word dose rate makes sense. We have things that are like, what is the, like, sieverts? That's, that's not a unit that means something to people. No, that's I had to, when I was it. watching Chernobyl, I had to look it up. I was like, what, what are they talking about? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, that doesn't mean anything. Um, and so it, it can be very difficult to like try to even research nuclear stuff as somebody who's not familiar with it because the terminology is so it's kind of out there. It doesn't, there's no conceptual understanding for what that terminology is. Hmm. Um, and sometimes we try to put things in terms of bananas because bananas have potassium in them and they have potassium four, which is radioactive. So sometimes we'll tell you in terms of bananas, you know, how many bananas do you need to eat in a two week thing to die from radiation poisoning or to get the same amount of radiation that you would if you were standing next to the Fukushima plant itself you know um and it's it's something like mm, in the span of two weeks you need to eat about like 500 million bananas is that a challenge i don't recommend it you're gonna die from a lot of things before you die from the radiation from that <laughs> um, i believe that was the plot to donkey kong country for the super nintendo 
I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, somebody stole all Donkey Kong's bananas. Um, Mairead, I have a, a couple more questions before we open the floor to our audience to, to pick your brain about nuclear. Um, and it's we kind of got sidetracked, but I was asking because I know you you work and you study how to keep nuclear stuff out of the hands of bad actors is any of that classified can you talk to us about some like maybe one or two things that you're the government of the united states or i don't know what canada does um but i'm sure there's like i I don't know anything about that i think people would be really curious so i can definitely talk about it um i'm going to talk about probably first something that i went to um livermore national lab in california to do about three or four weeks ago, probably four weeks ago now. Um, And what I went there to do is I went to work with a company who is working on active inspection, um, which means that they are setting up two different types of checkpoints at places at like shipping ports. One of the type is when you have your like container already loaded onto a truck and you're going to drive your truck out into the rest of the world. Um, Can we scan that truck, that cargo container, and see, is there anything nuclear-related that that should not be there? Um, Or, you know, it can be nuclear-related, or it can be things like... um, I was also helping to scan for cocaine and heroin um, and for explosives. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of ways they can do this. They can do both a passive interrogation and an active. Um, An active interrogation means that we're basically irradiating the whole thing and seeing what we can detect. And so so next- the truck is like bombarded with some kind of stuff that you can then make data readings on? Yeah, it's basically like, okay, what if we took an x-ray, like you would sort of get standard, we bump it up a little bit stronger, and then we try to x-ray the whole container. Um, and so you can do it in kind of two ways. You can do it like an actual x-ray where you're trying to get an image out of it. Mm-hmm. Um Or you can do it as something where you bombard it with all of this stuff. And then instead of getting an actual picture out of it, you get, um, you can set up a bunch of detectors and you'll get different spectrum. Um, So every, when you excite different isotopes, they have so much energy and that energy has to go somewhere. So a lot of them, when they de-excite, they give off that energy. They have too much of it. They have to get rid of it somehow. And different isotopes get rid of that energy in different ways. Yeah. Um, but they're very characteristic. So these isotopes, if you give them this much energy, they will almost always, or at least a large percent of the time, they will get rid of it in a specific way. And because we know what those specific ways are, we can see when we look at what we've detected, we say, hey, okay, This is what I expect to see in this truck. I expect to see, oh, there's that that I expect. You know, I expect to see some carbon. I expect to see something that could be iron because Mm -hmm. we have steel in there. I expect to see whatever. Um, And then you can, sometimes things will come up that you don't expect to see. Right, like a DeLorean with plutonium in it or something. Exactly. Or, you know, explosives. Um, and things like that. And so that's called active interrogation, where you are bombarding the truck with something to try to get a response. Hmm. There's also passive interrogation, where you can just set up the detectors really close and make these trucks drive through fight really slowly and see if you get anything coming off of it that you don't expect. Hmm. Um, and that's without actually bombarding it. So those are kind of the two things that um, I was actually able to go to livermore national lab um a month ago and we were actively bombarding fake cargo oh that's fun (laughs) yeah it was fun um so we had two trucks we had one that had our basically x-ray machine in it and we had one that we were able to place the fake um we were these two different sources of radiation and then three different fake 
uh, things that should not be there and, and be able to see like, okay, can we see this? How far away can we get from it? Can we move it up and down and still see it? How many dimensions can we rotate it? Um, and so that was one of the things that I was doing there. Um, but my dissertation is actually about, the best way to put it is that um, I do neutron x-rays of spent nuclear fuel after it comes out of the reactor. Um, so I get an image. My whole point is to generate an image and have that image show you exactly what the spent fuel looks like. It should also tell you um, how long it was in the reactor for, what like the major components of that fuel rod are, um, and from that information, from the picture and the length of time that it was there, you can tell if something is missing. Um, and if that something is missing has been taken and used for a, a bad purpose or anything else. Oh, like uh, some of it, like there's supposed to be X, Y, Z there and you're mixing the Z of the X, Y, Z. Yep. Oh. Um, or, you know, I'm supposed to have 289 pins in this. And at some point, the reactors go through three different cycles. Um, so spent fuel, by the time it comes out, most of the time, it will have gone through three burn cycles. And you could see that using the technology that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if uh, one of the pins breaks, you're allowed to take it out and replace it with a new one. But you have to log that. And there's a very specific way to log that. Um, however, if they were to use my thing and they looked at it and they said, hey, this pin over here only went through one burn cycle. And we don't have a log anywhere of where the pin that went through the other two burn cycles is. Where is it? Um, they have to go through and make sure that they can account for where that is. Is it being stored safely? Has somebody taken it for some purpose? Where exactly is that? Where did it go? Hmm. Um, so that's, you know, those are two of the security things that I've been working on um, over the last couple of years just to make sure that we need to know where all the radiation is to make sure that it's where it's supposed to be and it's nowhere that it shouldn't be. So we don't let, as as I said, a B level Tom Cruise villain get their hands on it. Exactly. That's right. Okay, I have one more question before we open up the floor to our audience, and uh, <laughs> it's in your bio. And I was talking to my classes today that I was going to talk to you, and two kids actually were very excited for me to ask this question. They're like, "You need to ask her this question," and that is, "What the heck is uranium glass or glasses?" Okay. Like are these are these glasses you put on your face and then you have radiation laser vision or something? Like what's going on there? So they are not glasses that you put on your face. They're oh. glasses that you drink out of. Okay. Um, so here in Knoxville, we have a really strong brewery culture. We have a lot of breweries, a lot of beer going on in the area. Okay. Um, and so there was a glass blower that a number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago, it could be shorter than that, whatever, a master glass blower decided that he was going to start making beer glasses in different shapes to go with all of these craft beers. And that way it would change the smell. It would, you know, the same way that for wine glasses, sometimes the different shapes for the wine glasses give it you know, are, are better for tasting that wine. He <laughs> said, why don't we do that for beer? Okay. Um, so we have a craft beer glass blower who is also just in general a uh, glass blower um, for lots of things. They undertake lots of projects. And at some point during COVID, uh, they were doing online auctions of pieces that they made. And they happened to come across some uranium glass, um, kind of like the old depression glass. World War II area. Um, so they had taken these pieces of glass and they had swirled it with their own glass, the clear glass that they used, and they made these beautiful, fantastic um, drinking glasses that with 
a UV light, they will glow green because they what? have actual uranium cane in them. So I snapped that up so quickly. Is that safe? Uh, like, is that going to yeah. give you three eyes? Like, what? Nope, it's not going to give you three eyes uh, because the same uranium is that same thing that, you know, people are holding in their hands. It's oh. before it's actually irradiated. It's just the natural uranium. Um, so they got this and uranium actually is very good at not moving once it's placed in glass. It's called vitrification. Um, and we actually do it a lot for spent fuel. Right. I remember us talking about this or maybe that was with Amanda. That might have been with Amanda. Okay. Um, but so this is things that aren't even quite, that are not otherwise irradiated. They're things that have a decay that's on the order of, you know, their half-life is a billion years. Um, but if you put a UV light on them, they glow bright green. What? Re- so, do you, so these glow for you? You have these in your house? I do. I bought the first one and I posted a picture on Twitter with mine what? with UV light on it. It's in your profile somewhere? It is. And everybody okay, I'm looking so... right now. Where is this? I am it was I feel like back is it a ways in... ago? Well, just keep talking. I'm gonna keep looking. <laughs> it should be in twenty twenty. It should be in maybe November of twenty twenty. Okay, all right. Um, so from this, everybody in the nuclear community got very jealous because we are all very big nerds for nuclear specific things. Oh my god, um, it's glowing it's got stripes of green on it, Maraid. Oh yeah, you're gonna find so many more. What? So actually I'll t- give you a little bit. So I had this first glass. I posted it. Everybody was jealous. Yeah, said, I'm oh, jealous. I-, I want one. I'm sorry. I'm di- said, I'm distra- distracting you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's all good. They said, how can I get one? And I said, well, I got it from this glass. Or let me contact them. Um, so I did. So actually, I made an order, like an interest form. And I sent it out through nuclear Twitter. And I got retweeted by some of the bigger nuclear people. <laughs> um who filled out this interest form, I took the interest form to the glass blower. And that first order was, I believe, 75 glasses from people all across the country (laughs) who wanted one of these glowing uranium glasses. Yeah, do Um, you think? Yeah. And so it was so popular and people were tagging me in them when they finally when they arrived. Um, and then other people who hadn't heard about it the first time were so jealous that they said, can we do another round? So we did do another round of it. I had another interest form that I sent out. Um, and this time we had another, you know, 75, 78 glasses <laughs> that people requested. You should be an affiliate um, for this person. You should be making money off of this. Well, you know, I just sort of bring this together and now it's kind of one of the hobbies that okay. I have. Um, they, so the glasses are expensive, um, because it is a, it is 100% done by the owner and operator of the, uh, glass blowing, uh, workshop here in Knoxville. Yeah. And they do all the shipping. So it is kind of a custom masterpiece. (laughs) Um, so one of the things that people brought up at the first round was, Hey, can we sort of fund to help grad students who maybe can't afford it, but thinks that this is really cool. And so I, yeah, across the two rounds, I got about, you know, $900 worth of donations from people in industry who just wanted to like help out and make sure that grad students could get one of these classes, grad students in nuclear engineering or nuclear chemistry or something, um, could get one of these if they were really interested in it. Uh, And so I've been able to, send that money to graduates um, and other people who are having a difficult time financially so that they can enjoy the glasses too for a price point that's not as high. Um, I would never ask the glass blower to lower their price because they are matching what they do. I know yeah. it's not easy to source, yeah. but it's very, very kind of like the people who are working to um, send money, whether it's, you know, some of them can send me five dollars. Some of them can send, you know, as much as fifty. A couple of department <laughs> heads have sent me like a hundred dollars. 
um, because they're sending some of their students. So they're like, hey, I'm going to send you $100 to help some of my students to try to like lower the cost. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, so it's really it's really cool from a nuclear standpoint of now a ton of us have these uranium glasses that <laughs> still glow under a UV light. Yeah. It's also really cool from a community standpoint, the number of people who are willing to like uh, go out of their way to make sure that grad students that maybe they did not know or didn't even really know exist can participate in this as well. Um, I if love anybody it. is inter- yeah, if anybody's interested, there's still a form on my page that you can fill out. I don't believe the pretentious has sold all of them yet. Oh, uh, I might be filling that form out. That sounds fascinating. They do ship to Canada. I oh, just good. shipped one in the second order all the way to Germany. I want a glowy glass. Um, I think we did also send one to Canada. Perfect. Um, maybe to make master area. Okay. Um. So, yeah. That's it, cool. So they are not glasses like the seeing glasses they are glasses like the drinking glasses but they are very cool they're a really cool like talking piece and they are fully functional um so it's a I'm, very cool thing i'm not a beer drinker um but i do like like a cold glass of sparkling like um water with like some fruit in it or something so I think having a glowing glass of that, even though it's not used for the intended purpose, I think I might fill out that form. Um, yeah, it's still cool. Yeah. Murad, are you okay with me opening up the uh, floor to the audience? We've gone over the interview section. And I thought maybe some people would have some questions for you. Um, Definitely. If, if that's okay. I don't want to keep you past our time, but um, we might have to go like till 7, 10, my time. Is that okay? So 10 after? Yeah, that's fine. I don't have it. I'm doing fine my dog is still awake and doesn't eat it go to bed yet so we're we're fine okay perfect so uh if you're just joining us for science chat i have nuclear engineer Mairead monaco with me today um and if you would like to ask a question about nuclear power and i i omitted the question i normally ask you can probably hear the 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 cute animal barking in the background somebody might want to ask about that that's usually the question i also don't ask um you can request the mic to ask Maraid, a question. Okay, we've got Liz coming up. Now, I'm Chris is here in spirit, but she's not here. So I'm running the space by myself right now. So um, go ahead, Liz. Figuring out family isn't your ordinary podcast, it's a completely new experience that helps you make your family the best it can be by giving you the deep insights to help your family thrive. You'll learn how to help your family have more productive conversations and manage life's disappointments too. You'll feel inspired by the special guests that are experts in their field of family relationships. Get valuable tips for dealing with difficult family members, repair broken relationships, improving your parenting skills and keeping your children happy and healthy. Check it out now. Well, good evening. Um, hey, Marie. So I just had a question. You, may, you already kind of touched on this a little bit. Why do you think that nuclear energy has gotten such a bad rap? Do you think it's like a, a reference bias? Like we can only think of Fukushima and Chernobyl? Or do you think your average everyday person just doesn't understand it? And what can we do to help people understand how good this is compared to some of the crap we use now. Yeah. Um, so part of it is definitely the reference bias. Um, in, in that the only time that a lot of people hear about it, I guess the kind of the two times that people might hear about it are either the disasters or they hear about the nuclear Navy, um, which in the U.S. is exceptionally reliable. So you kind of really don't hear about it that much. Um, that a lot of our submarines are nuclear powered with small reactors on them. Um, so, you have nuclear powered submarines? Yes, we do. I don't even yeah. think Canada we've has a nuclear, single submarine. We've had nuclear powered submarines for quite a long time now. Okay, that's um, the thing. Yeah, since at least the 1960s, we've had nuclear powered submarines. Oh, wow. Okay, I'll be quiet. I know nothing. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, that's. But you've never heard of it because, well, 
nothing's ever gone wrong. Oh, no, I knew you guys uh, had that. I watched The Hunt for Red October with Sean Connery. I knew this. Okay, I'll be quiet. No worries. Um, so, yeah, so those are the two things that, you know, we have that people have heard of, generally. Um, so a lot of it is that, one, nuclear has terrible PR. Our, we do, like don't have our own PR people, um, or if we do... You know, it, it's kind of a newer thing that we have decent PR. Um, we run into a lot of issues with um, a lot of the time because it's, you know, it, it doesn't make a ton of sense if you, you know, are trying to learn about it. If you're trying to go from knowing nothing to figuring out what's going on there, you know, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, it's it's hard to figure out what a lot of the terms mean because they don't relate to anything that we're used to. Um, so part part of it is that, and part of it is that a lot of the time people who are pro nuclear power are very rude about how pro nuclear power they are. We have a really <laughs> big we have a very big problem with that where the people who are pro-nuclear power can be exceptionally rude about it. And it's really off-putting. Um, and it's, it's off-putting even to people who have PhDs in it that, you know, you can say something and, you know, not all nuclear engineers agree. Some people have diff- like slightly different opinions um, and somebody will immediately turn around and go off on you in, in a terrible, rude way. <laughs> And they'll be like, well, you're, you you don't understand this. You're just too dumb to understand it. And you're like, whoa, hold on. And you think that that's a good way to communicate with anybody? Because it's not. So, you know, it, it is something that's not easy. It's not easily accessible because of the terminology that we use. And then half the time, the people who are talking about it aren't so rude about it and they're so discouraging and it kind of makes you not want to look any more into it and you're just like oh i don't want to deal with that so it's really a combination of things which is why i would say nuclear has the worst pr out there um but it is getting better and there's a lot of people here on twitter who are putting a lot of time Mm -hmm. and energy into making sure that nuclear communication is improving and people really can understand Maria, i've noticed that on twitter in the last three years that's how i ran into you actually um on twitter yeah uh twitter is a really big nuclear has a really big nuclear following um there's a big community and everybody is generally everybody is trying to make it approachable without being terribly rude about it mm-hmm. without talking down to anybody which is which Liz, I hope that answered your question. That is the kiss of death in science communication is being um, condescending. A jerk. Yeah, condescending. Never going to yeah. get anything across. Mm-hmm. Liz, great question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Paula. You're up next. Hi, how are you? Hi, Marion. Nice to have you tonight. Um, I've just got two... Uh, Comments. One, I, well, one question I'll ask later, but I just want to comment. I know exactly what you mean about glowing glasses. I collect depression glass, and I have a pedestal cake stand and a couple of dishes that are that really high intense green. And when you shut off the lights or put like a black light on it, it looks nuclear. Um, and I, I just never could serve food on it when I found out that there was uranium in the glass, but it's really prevalent in the old pieces. So if you, if you ever look up depression wear and look up what they call Vaseline wear, that has uranium in it. So I, I, I totally know what you're talking about. And um, my second thing is the question is about your puppy dog. You have a, is it a schnauzer? And he's adorable. <laughs> and what's his name? And um, I can hear him in the background making all kinds of rackets. So, you know, give us, fill us in about your cute dog. Yeah. So um, I'm really glad I said depression glass earlier because first of all, I love depression glass. Um, I've been looking and haven't been able to find, I want perfect, small depression glass um, 
uranium depression glass thing to be a soap dish. And I've been looking for it in an antique shop both here and in New Jersey for years. And I've never found the right shape or size, but one day I will find it um, <laughs> because I love it. Um, it's, it's so cool. Um, but yeah, super common. Um, half the time, if I go to an antique shop, I do bring a black light and I try to hide <laughs> it and make sure that I don't look anybody in the eye while I'm using it. Um, <laughs> But, you know, um, and then about my dog. Um, so, yeah, you can definitely hear her in the background. Um, this is Tibby. There's definitely many pictures of her on my Twitter at the moment because I love her. She is, we've had her for three weeks now. She is an 11 week old mini schnauzer puppy. She weighs five and a half pounds. Um, she definitely should be asleep right now, <laughs> but she's not asleep right now. Um, she went to her first ever puppy class today in person. We have done virtual training. This is her first ever in-person puppy class. And she killed it. She was so good. She knew how to sit. She knew her name. She knew how to lie. She was touching. She w- we were working on place, and she was doing such a good job. I know. I know. I can hear you. Everybody can hear you. Um, she would like me to pay more attention to her because, you know, she's awake. But actually, I think she's just up too late and now she's fussy because she's a baby. She's only 11 weeks old. <laughs> um, but yes, she is so cute. Um, she is definitely a piranha. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure who looked at puppies and said, you know what these things need? Razors for teeth. If you have any, like I, we had this big tweet we did uh, last, last yesterday, I think. And um, if you have any billowy clothes, Maraid, like my wife had all of these billowy scarfs, just you should just put them in a fire, uh, put them in a pile and set them on fire because they're just going to be wrecked. Um, The puppy will shred them. Oh, yeah. Um, Fortunately, it's been pretty hot here. So I've been wearing shorts most of the time. Uh Oh, but then Um, your skin's exposed. And then I cover myself with a blanket. (laughs) There's a whole process um, because, yeah, I also shared. I retweeted your thing about how potty training is difficult um, because it was raining yesterday. Yep. And so she's so low to the ground that when it's raining, the grass gets her feet wet, gets her belly wet. She puts, always puts her face in it, so her face is all wet. <laughs> uh, I took the most hideous photo of this dog I have ever taken. She looks like a drowned rat. And usually she's so cute, but she was just a mess. And what we had to go, we had to do the potty training. Yep. Um, so, you know, she's doing pretty well. She sleeps all the way through the night now. Um, actually she has since we got her, um, we'll, I'll take her out probably around probably nine thirty, nine forty five tonight and we'll get up tomorrow around six and she won't wake up and she won't have any accidents in her crate. Oh, yay. That's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is our new puppy and she's biting me constantly. But she is really a very good girl. She's just in a phase. So I'm sure you remember. Oh, I I see puppy pictures. I see a puppy, and I'm like, you know, we could get a third dog. What's you know, thir- three's an odd number. Why not get four? You know, night two two pairs of dogs. I mean, it's, you know, an extra dog isn't that much harder than one dog. And apparently, they get ex- they get easier the more of them you get. I guess so. I talked to a guy on the, for the science podcast, uh, who's a, a musher today and he, they have 30 dogs. They have teams of dogs for, cause they're training for the Iditarod and <laughs> no, it takes them their whole day is their whole life is looking after the dogs. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. But the dogs are I like, it's like athletes. Um, if you, if your athletes were athletic toddlers, so it, it's a lot of work. Tibby, you are not an athletic toddler. You are very clumsy and regularly fall on your face. Uh, but you're trying real hard. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Paula. Oh, you're welcome. I got one more thing to say. We come from, I come from Connecticut and we do have nuclear subs because we build them. So we're in New London. There's a big nuclear sub base there and they build them there. So you'll have to come down to Connecticut, Jason. <laughs> you know, when I said that, I was like, I, I thought... I knew the States had nuclear subs because you guys got a whole bunch of nuclear weapons. I was like, okay, that's gotta be a thing. And I was like, wait a second. 
And then I remembered it was in one of my favorite movies as a kid, The Hunt for Red October. Sean Connery was defecting on some kind of Russian silent sub. And I swear there was an American sub chasing him that had nuclear something somethings. I don't know. I forget the whole plot of it. I just know Sean Connery was on the sub. Maybe Alec Baldwin too. I forget. Somebody back me up. Does it, is that the plot of Red October? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I, okay. I, I remember the movie too. Yeah, you're you're pretty spot on. I'm the so, yeah. I'm the captain of the Russian submarine. You know, he had that. That's I'm pretty right. sure that's not a Russian accent guy. <laughs> no, that's pretty bad. <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll take uh, we'll take one more question. Um, Mikey, we'll bring you up here. One second. Oh, we've got a whole bunch more people. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, I, mean, I I know you have to go um, because it's Adam's birthday. Have it is. I have to go. I have to go at seven ten. So we'll maybe um, we'll maybe take a couple more questions. That's good. Um, uh, anybody is welcome to DM me with whatever questions if they're pressing and they don't get okay. answered. Um, if I can't answer them, I'll talk to Amanda or anybody, and we'll we'll get we'll get you an answer. Okay, uh, Kiki, uh, that one person, I brought them up and then they're gone. I don't see them. Uh, Kiki, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Kiki. How's it going? Hi, it's going well. Thank you so much. Um, uh, well, thank you for um, hosting this space and for um, talking about nuclear energy. Uh, I'm Greek and um, I was, um, I think, uh, I don't want to date myself, but when Chernobyl happened, uh in Europe, it, it was uh, very devastating. However, uh, the um, as you very correctly said, uh, it wasn't uh, the protocols wasn't weren't followed pro uh, properly um, by the country uh, back then, as they have been in the United States, who has very very strict and accurate protocols. Uh, mm. Ergo. Uh, nuclear submarines and uh, safely uh, safety practices that are um, that have lasted for years. Uh, so uh, yes, accidents can happen, uh, devastating accidents. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, there are um, scientists that uh, do follow through um, and uh, and uh, go through that. So uh, thank you for normalizing and bringing that up. It's it's very important uh, to know because the especially for people who are European, there there is some trauma connected uh, to uh, this series of events. So thank you so much for uh, for saying that. Um, what I uh, what I would like to uh, to ask you is um, if there is any um, if you know um, if um, in the future, uh, nuclear energy uh, and uh, al alternative uh, kinds of energies uh, would be um, more mainstream uh, regarding especially high school students who would be interested in exploring that. I know you cannot really start bringing uranium into high schools, uh, but uh, <laughs> would, would that be something that, um, let's say, with uh, the assistance of a university or that, uh, you know, uh, high schools can go over to certain universities or uh, programs that can be subsidized uh, for for uh, students who would be interested in exploring safe ways um, and learning more about nuclear energy. Would you happen to know of such programs uh, or would you... Um, would you be um, interested in beginning something or do you think that it's not appropriate for students who are that young? That is my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, first thing I wanted to say was um, I there's a certain level of when you talk about nuclear disasters, um, you know, to some extent, when we talk about them, we want to kind of move past the disaster, but I don't want that to ever come across as us downplaying the the suffering of the people who were there at the time, um, especially, you know, the family that it impacted and everything else. I don't want to ever sound like we're downplaying what, what really happened. Um, we do tend to do a lot of like, you know, let's say other things about it and how it can never happen again. Um, but I, as I said, I don't want to ever come across like we're downplaying 
how people felt and and you know the the trauma that occurred to both individual and um in, in policy and everything else you know um but after that talking about outreach programs so we actually do a quite a bit of outreach um both the national labs and the universities we do a lot of outreach um and and we really try to go out of our way to do quite a bit of outreach as well um so university of tennessee does which multiple times a year um and as whenever whenever i'm available um i try to do it as well um we have people come to the university um and we have demonstrations that we do about you know about radiation itself and about the many different applications of nuclear energy or of nuclear um in general and like what we can do with radiation and Oak Ridge National Lab and all of the national labs do similar things. Um, we also have chapters like the American Nuclear Society that they're all over the U.S. Um, and they do their own outreach with high schools. Um, so sometimes it does feel like maybe it's slower or it only kind of reaches in high schools. Um, but lots and lots and lots of different groups are trying to do it from you know, the American Nuclear Society to different departments at universities um, to, you know, the national labs are also trying to do it. Um, we have, you know, I'm also part of the international, um, INMM, international, wow, I am blanking. Um, international Amazing Nuclear Engineering Super People. Something like that. Uh, <laughs> You'll have to forgive me. I'm drawing a blank. Um, but we have international organizations as well that do outreach. A lot of times it's locally. Um, we do have programs to try to get high schoolers into national labs. Um, we don't always have programs to try to get students to come. Inter- Thanks, Amanda. Amanda just texted me. Institute of Nuclear Materials Management because <laughs> I blanked um so and that's an international and they they do outreach uh in their own countries as well um so we we don't have as many programs trying to get high schoolers to spend like a week at a university doing something everything is generally uh, a couple of hours or a day long thing sometimes there are programs that keep them there longer um but it is generally short segments but there are a lot of people in their own areas doing the best like in their own local areas trying to talk to high schoolers um we have books about nuclear energy like children's books and so the american nuclear society will take the children's books and they will go to libraries or elementary schools and they will will read along um and then they'll answer some of the questions that the elementary school kids have so we're definitely trying to talk about it more um, and get people more familiar. Again, this is probably a push that's been maybe the last 10, 15 years. Um, And it's really very localized to places where they have power plants, where they have universities, where they have national labs. Um, So I didn't grow up with it because I grew up in central New Jersey and the only power plants are in southern New Jersey. Um, so it's not something that I had ever really seen, but if you are in the area where it's kind of happening, they do try to reach out to anywhere elementary, middle through high school to try to have these conversations. Thank you for the response. Thank you so much. Great question, Kiki. I hate to do this. Um, normally I can run a space for as long as possible, but today is a different day. Um, it's my son's birthday and I, Chris has already gone to the restaurant and I have to leave now. So I'm so sorry. There's a couple speakers I brought up. Um, but if I take your questions and I last, if I go too long, I'm a dead man. So <laughs> I'm going to have to wrap it up. Now, the good thing is um, Maraid you have a bunch of nuclear friends. Um, we could maybe do uh, another one of these in a month or something where, uh, if we have a bit more time, um, with another, another person, or if you, if you're free again, I'd love to have you back. So there's always that maybe. 
yeah, uh, we can try and do a panel or something. Um, I'm sure if she's not too busy, Amanda loves this kind of thing. She'd mm. probably be happy to jump on Perfect. Uh, and talk for about her stuff. So there's definitely a lot of people who would be happy to try and do a panel um, where we, we really get into questions yeah. more so than you listen to me talk too much. That happens <laughs> a lot too. No, it's all good, Maraid. Um, so we'll just, we'll just wrap stuff. We'll just wrap stuff up here one second. Cause, and then I do have to go. I do see, I brought up some people and thank you for your, uh, for being gracious with me, not letting you speak. Um, so, uh, special thanks to our guest tonight, a Maraid. If you don't follow Maraid, what you doing? Um, just click on the profile there and give Maraid a follow. Maraid, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Love chatting with you Thanks about for nuclear. Me. I'd love, yeah. I again, like I said, I could talk nuclear with you for hours, um, and I'll I'll maybe DM you in a bit, uh, and we'll think about setting up a panel, a uh, nuclear panel where people can just pick your brain about a whole bunch of different stuff. Sounds great. Have a great time. Good night. Yeah, you betcha. Um, this space was brought to you by our sponsor, Bunsen Stuffy 2.0. <laughs> We're really excited. We just launched. Bunsen and Stuffy 2.0. The link is in our profile. Um, and that's, I'm just so excited about that. I would love to talk more, but the time's ticking down and I gotta go. So take care, everybody, for science, empathy, and cuteness, especially on days like this. Gather and be kind to each other. Okay, take care. Oh.